Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 295 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. The FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report is sponsored by the Red Flag Group. The Red Flag Group is a business advisory, information services, and technology firm that helps corporations, financial institutions, governments, and SMEs to manage their integrity and compliance in their businesses and with their third parties. You can find out more information on the Red Flag Group by checking out their website, www.redflaggroup.com. Today I have back with me Juliet Liu. Juliet is the <clears throat> head of professional services for the Red Flag Group in the Asia Pacific region. I visit with her about how to easily outsource small to medium sized investigations. The episode comes in at about 25 minutes. I think you will find it very informative, both for an efficiency and cost effective basis. This is Tom Fox. I'd like to thank you very much for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. But here's what we're going to visit with you about today. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? The solution for closing out investigations. How to use outsourcing effectively. Are there any special factors to consider? What you need to get started. And I've heard you talk about pain points for investigation. And uh, for both um U.S. or U.K. companies that may have operations in the Far East, but also for companies' headquarters in the Asia-Pacific region. Could you walk us through what you mean by that and what are some of the uh, mechanisms to begin to start thinking through that issue? Right. So in working of so many different companies over the years, we've seen some common and reoccurring pain points that arise when not even investigations pop up, but even just minor issues that seem to be plaguing organizations all around this region or otherwise. I think some of these we'll walk through, but let's look at the first one. Issues usually happen in non-English speaking countries. Finding good local legal and compliance resources can be difficult. Do you go to a local law firm? Do you find someone internally who can quickly go and pick up some documents and review them in local language? How do you do the interviews? We may have many companies now have large compliance offices in Hong Kong, Singapore, and China. But what if an investigative issue or something that warrants an investigation um, pops up in Thailand, in Vietnam, um, even in Myanmar or Laos? Usually, companies have not developed to a point where they have local compliance resources to deal with that issue. Secondly, prioritizing what appears to be a small issue can take up valuable resources. So, in the everyday life of a compliance officer, there may be issues that are more burning, will take precedent, or generally are just more of a priority because attention has been given to it from management. So how do we deal with some of these small issues that continuously pop up and that we leave open? As we'll see over the course of this webinar, leaving an investigation issue open is probably some of the worst things you can do. Another pain point is investigations or some of these reviews, they tend to drag on. Um, It takes ownership and a very fast approach in order to close them out. And lastly, I think everyone has experienced this. Costs can escalate. Legal costs are high, generally. That's just a universal fact. E-discovery platform costs are high. As we spoke last week, many e-discovery platforms charge a base minimum fee. They also charge sometimes an annual subscription fee. And then on top of that, they charge per data ingested, meaning if you load 50 gigabytes, because that is just how big someone's laptop is, they will charge for the entire 50 gigabytes, even if what may be relevant in the end will be one megabyte. It doesn't matter. They will charge with all data ingested and loaded into the system. And no doubt, cost can escalate because not closing an investigation just adds to cost because you generally lose control and then costs just skyrocket because you're trying to close it as fast as possible and you're paying expedition fees and acceleration fees and just throwing resources into it by the time it gets big. But no doubt, all issues, small or large, do need to be closed. And Tom, we did speak last week about the cost of not monitoring, but this week we thought we'd talk about the cost of failing to close out an issue. Well, certainly that's one of the key areas that I don't think companies really think through. And the difficulty or problem is in the era of hyper-transparency, uh, it is almost impossible for an issue uh, not to, 
to get out to the, either the public or the regulators or within the industry. And so if you fail to close that out, uh, you can really lead to a much costlier um, problem that might pop up. So, Julia, I guess what I would ask is, uh, from your perspective as someone who handles investigations, what are some of the things that you have seen, specific things that you have seen that can lead to uh, an, an issue which may appear small, nevertheless is, is not addressed in a timely manner? What are some of the difficulties companies have gotten into? Right. So I like the term you just used, hyper-transparency. And in some senses, um, especially more recently, you can see that data leaks has become destructive. So transparency has almost become destructive, especially towards corporations and that very traditional sense that we have over ownership of information and data and confidentiality has just completely gone out the window. And so it, it does take a special type of person and a number of factors combined for someone to be a whistleblower, to make a report, to report an allegation. This person is normally disgruntled. They have tried to address the issue um, internally and no one's responded. They've tried to speak to someone on the ground and no one has really addressed it in a way they want it to be handled. And so what we've seen is what appears to be or what has appeared to be a minor issue, maybe a competitor was alleging, oh, well, your team are um, they're bid rigging and they're cutting me out, or I was formerly the, the best middle person for your deals and now I've been cut out because this person is using their brother-in-law's company. And this person will try and address it internally, get no response, and then they go external. They go to the media, they go onto Twitter, they go onto Glass, they go to a number of numerous unending platforms out into the market and just release very damning information about the company. So part of it is um, local awareness and responsiveness, but another part is actually, I know and we understand that many companies don't have the resources to easily assign to address some of these things when they start. So our solution is to close out issues ASAP, um, but how? And we'll walk through some of our recommendations today. So, Tom, I want to talk through some of our suggested solutions here. One of them is targeted investigations using our in-house e-discovery platform. So, I would like to walk through this, but here is a very quick summarized diagram of our workflow. Basically, what we have done and what we can do is as soon as an issue arises, escalate fast and hard internally, get the commitment to address it. Now, we can help with the data collection piece on the left here. We can tunnel into email servers. We can retrieve laptops. We can even pick them up for you. Um, or you can mail us the laptops. You can mail us the hard drives. We then simultaneously, whilst we load that into our system in preparation for review, we may do a background check to check for conflicts of interest. Then we will start the email and document review and the interviews and reporting out. Now, how does it work? We load keywords into our platform and do a search. Now, let's walk through a step-by-step -step example. A side company, seemingly not a huge issue up front, but one of our clients and one of the companies, um, one of the biggest IT companies in the world, they had a new Bosnian distributor and they were, I guess, a bit suspicious that this third party had risen to become one of the top tier resellers within the course of two years. This company that was this brand new incorporated two years prior had risen out of nowhere to become one of the largest market share distributors in the region. They asked us to do a quick due diligence. This took us about four days. We confirm that the director was the brother-in-law of a sales manager, meaning they did not share the same surname, but through interviews and discreet inquiries, we did uncover the fact that he was his brother-in-law. So then we went into the emails and we targeted out of the whole realm of emails that we were going to look at, 
we targeted about 5% and we estimated that 5% was actually probably enough for us to load into our data system and do a quick search. We use the name of the brother-in-law to find the emails. Um, 5,000 results, that's not bad. That's actually very, um, very digestible. We used the customer names where the side company was a distributor. We narrowed it down to about 100 or 200 results. And the outcome was that we were able to substantiate a conflict of interest. Now, why was this important? Why didn't we stop? Why did the company not stop at the first round after we confirmed that brother-in-law was related? It's because in parts of the world, especially with people that have long years of tenure, to terminate certain employees will... It takes a lot because there are strong employment laws, especially in um, countries which are formerly part of the USSR. It takes a lot of proof of wrongdoing in order to be able to terminate someone without paying them out for their 15 years of service. So we calculated and the company did calculate that if they had to pay this person out, despite knowing that they had done something wrong, but without actual substantiated proof, they would have had to pay him 300,000 US dollars. So they asked us to do this search. We literally completed it in seven days. So it was one and a half weeks. We did the due diligence. We checked the emails. We found proof. We sent a script for interviews um, outlining the key issues that we found so that the um, on-ground finance team could do an interview because they didn't have a local compliance team. And that was from beginning to end. It was less than two weeks. And we were, they were able to terminate the staff member without paying him out um, based on tenure. Julian, if I could, on the outcome uh, that you determined, from my perspective, it seems to me that the outcome and how you documented that outcome is important not only to close out the individual matter, but you can utilize the outcome in a variety of ways. You Uh, described one remedial step that you were able to take, but you can use this um, substantive outcome as both a defensive measure if uh, that employee then brought suit or some other legal action, but there may be other legal issues that would have arisen or arose, which because of the quick resolution, you were able to document and have company counsel either prepare uh, other, other steps or at least have something in the file so that if a regulator did come knocking, the company would be able to document that the the matter was uh, evaluated, the matter was investigated, and then the matter was remediated with an outcome. So I think that final step uh, really is, it's a step, but it can lead to uh, multiple uses with the outcome you uh, present uh, as uh, part of the Red Flag Group solution. Yes, completely. The documentation of the methodology in which we took to uncover this conflict it was critical to showing defensible approach and to show that company has taken steps in order to address this issue. And we have a small group today, so I'm very happy to talk about fees. Even from the first step when we did the due diligence, that only cost a few thousand dollars. And in the end, because we're looking at one or two custodians and we narrowed it down to one particular issue that we were trying to find, in the end, this investigation costs a fraction of what they would have had to pay if they had to pay that employee out for tenure or just for termination. So just even the cost effectiveness of this was of huge value to the company. I might talk about a second example. This was corruption potential corruption. Now, it did not start as an allegation of corruption. It started as a revenue recognition issue that was found in the Israeli office. Now, the revenue recognition issue was they were unable, and the company, when they were doing their yearly audit, they were unable to link up support contracts together with the hardware they were selling. And they were saying, well, either people are doing massive amounts of bundling or Massive discounts were being given out, and we're we're just losing control and transparency over how we're selling to customers in in Israel. Red flag, why don't you have a look? And it was a very broad scope. It was mostly 
it started out as being a transactional review. And we said, okay, why don't we look at some of your key distributors wh whom you're selling through and where some of these revenue recognition issues are arising. Did a very quick due diligence and we found, okay, there are maybe two or three companies where we need to look at. And it seems that these two or three distributor deals, somehow the country manager, despite his seniority, is always involved. So it seems like this person has a lot of control over these deals. Okay, let's have a look. Let's look at his emails. He's been in the company for 15 years. Um, now at the most senior position in Israel, um, and manages a number of countries in the region as well. 20,000 emails now. Let's filter that out and say, let's look at some of these companies and do a deep dive into these companies. We searched for those company names within his email and found that for some reason, he was communicating with his wife about these companies. So we did a deeper dive into the due diligence and found that the director was actually under his wife's name. And so she was using her maiden name, and that's why we couldn't pick it up before. But because we had we married up the email review together with the due diligence, we were able to confirm that his wife was the director and shareholder of that side company. So that was one line that we definitely just hit upon. And the unexpected result was that he had been running a side company for three years and funneling some of these major deals through them. And that's why on paper, on the financials, they looked legitimate, but some of them were being bundled into these deals that were not clear what products they were actually selling. We also hit upon something else. Um, we found communications of a certain government official, and we, set, we found communications where this country manager was interacting with the government official to ask for a favor to give to a customer. And so the emails were around, he was asking on behalf of the customer, the customer had a daughter, and as you know in Israel, um, conscription happens in military services for both genders, and he, he was asking whether this government official could possibly look after the daughter and assign her to a back office somewhere away from, away from action or combat. And so there was a corruption link as well. And so, again, you have someone who has been in the company for 15 years, is very senior, has done very well for the company, has done very well for himself as well. How do we find um, not only the smoking gun, but the actual pinpointing of the issues that he has been involved in for years and has been, um, I guess, in some senses, embezzling from the company? So, Julia, uh, if I can ask you on the outcome investigation, um, it didn't start out as a corruption investigation. Did you find that or would you uh, uh, speculate that the outcome could be used in a variety of ways similar to the prior slide where we had the uh, the one individual uh, distributor? This did not start out as a corruption investigation, but it turns out that it ended up being a corruption investigation. Um, this investigation took three to four weeks. Everything was done in a mixture of English and Hebrew. Um, I ran this investigation myself um, as a project lead, but all the resources we were reviewing were a mixture of English and um, local resources who could read um, who could read Hebrew. So, again, the documentation aspect is so important, not only from documenting the shareholdership and directorship of the wife, but also the direct emails linking his communication to this company to his wife, and therefore confirming that not only was there a side company going on. He was directly related and he knew about it. Um, we did do two rounds of interviews with this person. Once when we found the side company, but before we found the government official interactions. And even then, he denied it. He said, I don't know, this is just a company, not related, no idea. Um, he, he wouldn't back down. He just would not admit it. And then it wasn't until we prepared the information which contained the communication with the government official about the customer and the daughter, um, not only did we present that last, again, the second interview, that he, um, he actually just said he would resign. So um, even then, documenting each of those interview processes was in our final um, multiple renditions of that report. This is one of the best examples I have seen that speak to the need to 
uh, really jump on quickly and efficiently and close out investigations. Because if what appeared to be a relatively straightforward rec- uh, revenue rec, rev rec issue had not been investigated, you could have had significant uh, legal uh, and regulatory violations and legal exposure on a variety of fronts. But by uh, the company getting in quickly, uh, moving towards uh, resolving the issue, at least through the investigative stage, it uh, was able to turn up the conduct, stop the conduct, and if illegal activity uh, was uh, occurring, remediate that conduct uh, in a timely fashion so that if a regulator came knocking, you could demonstrate all of the steps necessary uh, to satisfy a best practices compliance program. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, further uses of use cases, um, we've used a similar methodology for abuse of marketing funds, systemic fraud. Um, that last example was definitely an incident of systemic fraud. Of course, the country manager is involved. He had his entire team in on his fraud that he'd been running for 10, 15 years. Um, bribery and corruption, conflicts of interest, bid rigging, collusion. Those last two have traditionally been very hard to pick up through even due diligence alone or email reviews alone. They need to be married together. They need to be targeted. They need to be done by the same people so that we know what we're looking for. If I go back a slide, we would not have found this if we weren't doing everything ourselves simultaneously, quickly using the same people. It's because there were names in the media research which we picked up on and we found why is his name coming up? It may seem innocuous when we're reading it through the media. It may seem innocuous when we're reading an email. Separately, they mean nothing. It isn't until we read them together and we thought, why are these names coming up? Can we change the search strings to look for this? Again, we looked at 10 people in this company. um, And in the end, the fees, um, it did not hit six figures. If this had gone to a law firm, it would have been a quarter million at least. And this is feedback that we got from our client who also used the law firm for separate issues. And they, they just were able to compare the different types of outcome, results, um, speed, efficiency, local language resources, and costs. And they told us outright, um, they can't believe we actually um, closed some of these things um, in a matter of weeks. So where we add value, yes, this is the same slides before, but 50 languages in-house. And this is just in-house capabilities. Um, We have offices all around the world. We're legally trained. Um, All investigations are led by lawyers, staff of forensic investigative resources. Um, We do understand monitoring. It's more than just a technology platform. So not only do we have our in-house platform, but we not only have built it ourselves, but we know how to use it. We know how to fine-tune it. And you have access to resources available at all tiers, whether it's just admin staff all the way to lawyers and principals. Um, same thing, what are the fees like? It's a very, um, you know, cost-effective IT server cost plus review time that we can give you up front and we can come up with a fixed fee cap and say we won't exceed this amount until we feel like we need to advise you on that. And lastly, um, are there any special factors to consider? Yes, there may be data in China that needs to stay in China. Again, we have ways to deal with this. We tunnel into China and we can gain access to information um, without causing information transfer and do the review locally. Yes, there are data privacy laws with respect to certain jurisdictions which need special attention. Um, again, there we understand where the legal line is. We work with your counsel to work out how to do this. Um, Yes, we can scan through everything from Lotus Notes to Outlook files to um, computer files and also attachments as well. A lot of the things that we found have been through attachments, spreadsheets, contracts, Word documents. What would be sort of the initial questions you would ask or the basic information you would need to begin to scope out uh, the, or, or build a scope of the assignment, and then from there, prepare some preliminary cost estimates for a potential client? It's a good question, Tom. So, preferably, we would do this over a call, maybe an initial email. We would like to get and obtain an understanding of the issues that you are already aware of and what you may have heard noise about. Happy to sign an NDA. We can get that done in half a day. 
we would also like to know how many people you think may be involved and maybe obtain some sort of quick organization chart and we can try and map out whether there may be potentially other people. Based on that, if it is related to a side company or due diligence, we can start that pretty much straight away. Um, we can start that on the day to check for directorships and shareholderships. But essentially, it's a number of things. It's just knowing the number of people that may be involved, the extent of the issues, whether there's one issue that you're trying to target or maybe there are six issues. And we can, based on that information alone, we can come up with a pretty, uh, pretty solid scope and um, we can try to keep it very tight. I have not seen too many instances where scope creep has just gone out the window. Um, I think we try and update, update the client, update the customer on findings as we go. We give communiques, weekly reports, um, even just an update on the number of volume of things that we're going through. If we encounter a surprisingly high volume, we will let you know. I don't think that's happened too often because we don't charge. This is the key thing. We do not charge by ingestion of per gigabyte. We charge based on the range. It's very reasonable. And because we can see the volume straight away, because we're not we're not trying to negotiate down the amount that we're trying to put onto our system. Because we have complete control and transparency over it because it's our own system, we can do the quick filtration upfront on what we estimate to be the volume. So, Juliet, uh, if I could just maybe uh, conclude with why I think these steps are important from the regulatory perspective. You mentioned the methodology and that you can prepare a detailed uh, presentation uh, showing the methodology of the triage, of the evaluation, of the scope of the assignment, then of course uh, the recitation of the facts you discover in the presentation of the outcome in a written written pre presentation or other. And from the regulator's perspective, that's absolutely what's required of a corporate compliance officer or corporate in-house legal representative to uh, demonstrate that when a matter comes in, it is appropriately addressed both internally and retention of expert outside counsel to lead the investigation when appropriate. And these medium to small level investigations are really the ones that tend to fall through the cracks because uh, they are not perceived to be as dangerous and so they don't get the attention and they're left to fester. And I think you've demonstrated to us if you leave something to fester, uh, multiple uh, violations could could continue to occur. But I really want to compliment you for the process that you have articulated because in large part compliance is about process and that's what regulators are looking for. Are you able to uh, have a process in place and do you follow through with that process? I think that sums it up very nicely, Tom. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. I have two calls to action for you. The first is if you are listening to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would uh, rank, uh, excuse me, rate our podcast. It will help our rankings going forward. The second thing is if you have any questions or uh, on this episode or if you'd like some questions answered on a podcast, shoot me an email at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening to this episode.